All right, it is 12.05, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just for anybody who I have not had the privilege to meet yet, my name is Claire Gouda. I'm the Director of Alumni, Faculty, and Graduate Students at the Intercollegiate Studies Institute. We are very excited to partner with the Tocqueville Foundation again for the second year in a row uh, to be able to attend the Tocqueville Conversations in Normandy coming up later this month. Uh, this Today, we are very excited to welcome uh, Dr. Jean Yarbrough from Bowdoin College, where she is a professor of government, and she is the recipient of numerous awards and author of several publications. Very glad to have her. We're also glad to have Dr. Joshua Mitchell, who's a professor of Georgetown and is the author of the most, his most recent book, American Awakening. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to you both for the for uh, this session. I think we will go until probably 1.30 Eastern time with um, 15 to 30 minutes of Q&A, depending how long you would like to go. Okay. Well, uh, let me just clear up something logistically. So I will run this session and Professor Yarbo will run the next session next week. Uh, we will no doubt have overlaps, uh, but, uh, but, but there will be differences too, it's inevitable. So let me start by uh, welcoming you. You're about to have the time of your life at the Tocqueville Chateau. Uh, here, I'm going to announce something. If you do not have goosebumps uh, in the library, which you will be uh, introduced to by Jean-Guillaume de Tocqueville, if you do not have goosebumps, you don't know which, what you're missing. Uh, you really have to pay attention. I, uh, I've studied political and social theory for 35, 40 years. And in my view, uh, almost all the turmoil that we have today can be traced from say the French Revolution th through the end of the 19th century to Nietzsche. So there's there's that framing, but of all the people who uh, who wrote in that period, and here I do include Marx, who I teach uh, and take very seriously, I think Tocqueville is the last man standing. And by that, I mean, um, he is the only one that here at the dawn of the 21st century uh, for whom we can say he has a comprehensive vision of what has happened, what is happening, and what is likely to happen. Uh, and the theory that he offers is what is the thing I want to discuss today. If I had three times as much time, what I would do today is the following. I would, I would lay out his general theory. I would indicate uh, what's happened really in the last oh, 50, 75 years uh, in, the, in the way of scholarship that's followed him. And I say this because one of the more interesting developments in the last 75 years have been a whole list of really great scholars who, who have understood that, that what Tocqueville predicted, uh, well, he has a dystopian vision and a, and, a, and a healthy vision. And what he worried about was that all the mediating institutions that we have, by which we mean family, uh, religion, local government, uh, these civic associations, these things would slowly, slowly dissipate. And much of the scholarship in the last 50 to 75 years on Tocqueville has chronicled that um, from, from Nisbet to Putnam and even into the tw 21st century here. Uh, but, but if I had more time with you, what I would do next is after sh showing you, talking with you a bit about that scholarship, I would then say that the, what we're really quite unaware of right now is that there's two additional threats. It's not just the atrophy of these mediating institutions that Tocqueville was profoundly worried about. Uh, I do think identity politics now is actively engaged in attacking these mediating institutions. And then something which I don't think many of us have thought about, there's a problem that I call um, substitutism, which is the replacing of supplements by substitutes. Uh, and I think that is something that is happening very quickly that too is an immense threat to these mediating institutions. And that's not something that is inaugurated by either the left or by the right. It's inaugurated by you and I in terms of the habits that we have in everyday life. Maybe we can talk about that later, but but the the burden of my, my conversation with you today really has to be um, to introduce Tocqueville to you in a, in a fairly high theoretical level. Um, the Tocqueville conversations that you'll be going to um, are informed by Tocqueville. There'll be a number of scholars there. I will be there, Gene will be there. Uh, and we we try every year to try to bring in his remarks or his understanding to bear on the problems of the 21st century. We've focused in the, a lot in the last few years 
on what could be called the problem of embodiment, the, the huge attack on populism um, <clears throat> as a kind of parochialism. Tocqueville has answers to this. And so we started out this conversation four or five years ago with an attempt to ask the question, is there a healthy way to understand the nation? Which I want to talk about here too, because I think Tocqueville gives us a way of understanding a number of these problems. Um, and, but let me also say something about the contemporary moment, especially in conservative circles, where I'm, I'm largely involved, but not exclusively. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, that the conservative movement is in a complete mess right now. Uh, you, can, you can blame it on Trump. There are lots of things you can blame it on. Uh, but, but really, the, the movement was, let's call it incoherent right from the start. Uh, its various factions agreed on what they did not like, but but they did not much agree on what they did like. And I think Trump just came along and kind of kicked the deck of cards or kicked the house of cards and the whole thing came tumbling down. So I don't so much fault him, but but clearly the conservative movement is looking for a way forward. The old method, which is a fusionism. Uh, is is not going to work where you bring the various parts together. There needs to be a comprehensive vision. And so what you're going to hear me say today is that not simply for the conservative movement, but for anyone who's interested in defending uh, liberty uh, into the 21st century, I think Tocqueville is the single figure we have to go to. We can supplement it by looking at others, but I think he allows us to comprehend the great movement of history that we're caught up in and don't fully understand. Now, the book, uh, Democracy in America, is it was in two volumes. Uh, he, the first book came out. He was instantly famous. He spends a few years in part up at his uh, in the on the desk, writing on the desk that we're going to see, uh, writing the second volume. The first volume uh, has just a few moments in it where where he sounds the alarm and says things could go very, very badly. Uh, but but by and large, it's a hopeful book. He then spends five years in, uh, in writing the second volume. It's a very different kind of work. It's, it, to use Nietzschean language, it's full of aphorisms, full of pregnant, short paragraphs that you read and you look off into the distance 200 years in the future and you think, well, maybe that's what's going to happen. So it's a much, much more deep, introspective look at what could be called the democratic soul. He, when you read Democracy in America, there will be times when you feel he has peeled back your skull and looked inside and you'll say to yourself, well, I thought these were my thoughts. And it turns out, no, these are these are the thoughts that come. Here's a quote from Tocqueville that come naturally into our imagination in the democratic age. His view was there's a new kind of humanity that has emerged. It's it's democratic man. And certain kinds of thoughts come naturally into our imagination and others don't. And, and the task of the new political science, and he calls for a new political science, is, is for you and I to understand what comes naturally into our imaginations and, and where necessary and to fight those habits that come naturally into our imagination. I'll talk about those um, in a while. Uh, the history of Tocqueville, just very quickly, his reception, his reading, it's mixed. I mean, he, he's always, I call him the geopolitical Tocqueville, that depending upon the geopolitical moment, uh, he's read in different ways. So during the Cold War, uh, it was all about American exceptionalism, which he invents. It's right there in the author's introduction. And then he has chilling passages about Russia toward the end of book one. So there's the Cold War Tocqueville. There's also for foreign policy, there's the domestic Tocqueville, which I talked about with Robert Nisbet, The Quest for Community, which you should all read, if not own. Uh, there, there was an understanding after World War II uh, that, that these mediating institutions, which were necessary for the founders' vision, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, these were slowly, slowly dissipating, withering, partly because progressivism came along and decided that the state was going to supplant the functions of these various meeting institutions, but also through sheer atrophy, laziness, citizens not understanding what is at stake when they lose them. So this was the, uh, as I said, Robert Nisbet and others. Um, and that tradition continued really after, after 1989, when people like Robert Putnam went to Eastern Europe or even Southern Europe and, and asked the question in the, in the aftermath of the fall of the Soviet Union, how do we rebuild democracy? And, and there was this great resurgence again um, of, of Tocqueville scholarship. The problem, though, is that he writes so beautifully and so brilliantly that you are often tempted 
to take a little piece of it and make that stand for the whole. And I think what you really need to do is read the entire book. It's a beautiful work. Uh, and it's more than just American exceptionalism. It's more than civic associations. Uh, it's a comprehensive account, even theories of art, theories of history. It's a comprehensive account. And I think the most comprehensive account we have to date uh, of this thing called the democratic age. I also want to pause here for a second and just list, uh, give you six or seven things, uh, problems that we're facing right now that I think he alone can help us think through. Uh, one, I'll, I'll be fairly quick about this because I really want to talk mostly about th the book and his ideas. First, what I call um, the, the binodal post-1989 configuration of globalism and identity politics. We talk about globalism, but what we don't also see is that the, what has occurred is that sovereignty has become split. Uh, we used to talk about national sovereignty, and now, of course, the movement with globalism is to repudiate national sovereignty and to go up a level. But what's interesting is that going up a level has also uh, been conjoined with going down a level. So now that our identities are seen to be sovereign. And so you have this binodal arrangement where we're, where we're focused on our identities and social media helps us do that. Uh, so sovereignty lies there, but then sovereignty is transnational. So it's, it's split. And Tocqueville saw this split, that on the one hand, the self would collapse in upon itself and see itself as the only authority. And on the other hand, it would, it would cow deferentially to the public beast. So he saw this bifurcated sovereignty. Uh, it's in the first three chapters of volume two. It's an extraordinary insight. So you always have to remember that when we're looking at the problem of globalism, it's not globalism alone. It's globalism and identity politics. And then the question is, what do we do about it? And his view is, well, of course, this is a profoundly unstable arrangement, and we do have to return to national sovereignty. So it's not an accident then that the high tech companies that don't want borders are also pushing identity politics, because what they're trying to do is to destroy the idea of the nation as a sovereign body. This is a very important insight. Also, as I, as I hinted a couple of minutes ago, he helps us name the whirlwind, populism, nationalism. Uh, I don't much like using the term populism. I'm forced to because I think everybody else is. But what Tocqueville saw was what could be called the French Revolution problem. And, and what he saw the French Revolution representing was the emergence of a disembodied human being who thought in terms of abstract universals, who hovered over the world, who was incapable of entering in in bounded freedom uh, into mediating institutions, into relations with others. This is the problem of romanticism, if you want. But what he saw was that this was a terrible move. There's an apparent freedom in that you liberate yourself from your history, uh, from your from the particularist commitments that every institution involves. Uh, and so there's the promise of liberation. And yet, in point of fact, it's a truance freedom. That's one of his words. It's the freedom of a runaway. And so he, he, he tells us in 1840, really 1835 in the first time, human beings need to live embodied lives. They must clip the wings of their imagination so that they don't drift off into abstract universals. And the only way to do that is through live face-to-face -face relations in our embodied communities. So it's not as if you have to defend nationalism. What we have to defend is embodied human life. And of course, uh, and we can talk about this if you wish, the, the movement towards transhumanism, digital substitutism, uh, the move beyond the generative world, all these things are attempts to repudiate embodied form. Uh, Tocqueville, he, he calls himself, he, he's a fallen Christian, but he still thinks Christianly. Uh, he still thinks in terms of incarnational form. So the, Christianly speaking, you, you, you enter into the world of time and you suffer. That's what it means to have incarnational life. And so it, it, I think Tocqueville has the same view that, we're, of course, we're confronted by limits in these mediating institutions, but through them, we also find our freedom. Just as Christianly speaking, through our suffering, we discover who we are. Uh, he never says that expressly, but, but many of my Christian students have noticed this over the years. So there, on his view, there has to be a healthy patriotism. We have to, the, the nation is the largest unit that we can effectively love, but we can effectively love and only through extension from our local community, our local involvement with our property, with our friends and building a community around respect for property rights, et cetera. Uh, and so he has immense, immensely important things to say about, about how you have what he calls well-considered patriotism. All these things we need to talk about, and yet what we're set up with 
what we're given really is this antinomy, this opposition between the promise of a fugitive perfection, that's to his word, this phrase uh, of, of cosmopolitan universal man versus uh, authoritarian uh, authoritarianism, fascism, the terms that are, are given as the, as the only possible alternatives to abstract universalism. And his view is no. The real alternative is embodied life, and we have to embrace it full on if we're going to uh, live uh, a, a, a fully human lives. Uh, also, I think he sees very early on the disappearance of the political middle, which is a problem, I think, maybe even more so in Europe. I don't know. It's hard to say. Uh, and by that, I mean um, he saw that the, the two likely moral positions to be taken, the two tempting moral positions to be taken, are, are one, a kind of leftward revolutionary uh, position in which we conclude that the task remaining, think about this, is to, is to disencumber us from all historical forms, all embodied forms. And so to move fully to universalism, this is the impulse on the left. And I think he thinks that there's, I don't know if I'm gonna call it the right, there's also a, a reactionary impulse. I don't even like using that word. I think what he saw was that there would also be a temptation to, to use Max Weber's language, to re-enchant the world, to, to believe that, that this, this world in which we're living in has, has no parsimony, has no coherence, and only by a, a deep retrieval of some largely imagined community um, can we, uh, can we uh, find resources to resist the absence of parsimony in modern life. And you only have to look at what happened in Europe in World War II to look at these two prominent, two prominent re-enchantment movements, National Socialism, which goes back to the mythical German Volk, and, uh, and, and fascism in Italy, which goes back to pagan symbols uh, of pagan Rome. Uh, this is an immense temptation. And it's easy because it's all, all we have to do is, is imagine uh, a world that is utterly coherent and parsimonious. And if you ask me after 35 years of reading Tocqueville, what he thinks the greatest challenge is, I would put it this way. Will there be souls that emerge? Will, will there be democratic citizens that emerge? that are capable of living in a disjointed world uh, that, that isn't completely coherent. Uh, and and he, his view is that we have to accept that. And, and I will also add that I think one of the reasons why he believes religion is so important is that it's, it offers a hope of a resolution in the future. So that the world of time is invariably broken, full of suffering, uh, and yet that's not the that's not the final argument against it, because all brokenness is redeemed through hope. And so he did think that Christianity of that sort that would allow us to live in a parsimonious world would be central, would be essential if we're going to be able to endure a life that doesn't quite fit. And I should add, you know, while we're thinking about it, uh, I, I don't like the term free markets. I like the term market commerce better. Uh, defenders of market commerce understood this. You don't build a total system top down that's utterly coherent. You you have an, an open ended, I won't call it a system, but an arrangement uh, in in which you don't pick out winners and losers, and it's it's rough and tumble, but it comports with the truth of the cosmos, namely that we can't bring about uh, coherence prematurely. He writes in the author's introduction. This entire book has been written under a kind of religious dread. What does that mean? Well, on his estimation, in the aristocratic age, and there are two ages for him, the aristocratic age and the democratic age. In the aristocratic age, notwithstanding its suffering and its turmoil, there was a kind of coherent, coherence that social, excuse me, social order comported with the very order of things. And he says, all that's thrown out. There are no, there are no, um, uh, comparisons that we can make. We're in a new world. Uh, and so he says, how, why has God put us in this world? There's a, there's a dread here. He can't understand why this has happened. Um, and yet at the end of the book, the second to the last page, he says, I, I prefer to doubt my own judgment than his justice. That is to say, there's a purpose here that we're not going to fully understand. Um, and, and our task is to establish, in a way I'm getting right to the end, but I want you to think about this, 
the age of equality is coming. Our task is to establish the sort of equality we're going to have, because there really are two choices going forward. We're going to get to equality. It's either going to be equality and servitude or equality and liberty. Those are your choices. We're getting to the age of equality. So uh, I think he, uh, he, he believes that the only way politically, the only way to, to responsibly live in the democratic age is not to choose the easy alternatives of dreaming of an enchanted past uh, or of having a revolution that destroys the existing state of things, but rather to take each step with each day uh, to greet our neighbor as somebody we we both know and don't know, uh, and to build a world together in competence, to use my language. Uh, that is our task, and, and in, in the end, it, it'll all get resolved, but he wonders whether people like this are going to be formed. And I will add, and I'll, I'll come to this later, I think he, the only way they can be formed is, is in the difficult labors of living in our mediating institutions in our families, which are which we both love and are a mess, all of them, uh, in our local communities, which we love and are a mess, in our country, which we love and is in a mess. Uh, and, uh, and we have to be able to endure uh, a, a world that's not perfect. And I'll come to this in a minute. He thinks that this longing for perfection is one of the deepest pathologies of the democratic age. We have to recognize that there is no perfection. There is no, there is no pure human health either. I will say, I'll say something about uh, why I think Tocqueville is the first theorist who thinks in terms of manic depression and bipolarity as the natural condition of man. Uh, I think uh, that, that even when he sees antidotes to this condition, he never says it's a cure. I'll butcher the English language. These antidotes make life slightly less difficult slightly less bad. They never cure. There is no cure. And we have to understand that uh, in the democratic age. There are no cheap shortcuts. And he worries that the democratic soul is impatient, uh, wants answers now. And on his estimation, it's a very long slog. Just quickly, I wasn't going to talk about this, but, but, but the after effects of slavery and the distrust between the races. This is not something DEI can solve in a few weeks or in a few months or in a few years. Uh, th th these wounds will take hundreds of years to heal. And we have to get busy and do the small things that we can in our local neighborhoods to begin to, <clears throat> to address that. But wounds take a long time to heal. And he wonders whether we have the patience to do that. But he thinks that only in our mediating institutions can we learn this, this long, slow patience with life uh, that's so necessary for democratic freedom. Uh, I think he also sees, uh, well, a lot of people saw in the 19th century, uh, Marx in a way, Nietzsche certainly, uh, Tocqueville, John Stuart Mill. What begins to become visible in the 19th century is this tremendous energy that had been unleashed at the beginning of modernity. And you can look at this in terms of sciences or political reconfiguration. Uh, that that slowly but surely we're going to enter into a phase that could be called the great exhaustion, where we're going to be frightened to do anything. And we see this now where we're, my students at Georgetown and, and I suspect almost everywhere are scared to death to actually open their mouth and say things that they believe for fear of cancellation. Nobody's prepared to take any risks, uh, even, even in terms of, uh, let's call it industrial policy, the, the whole idea that we might have another great industrial leap forward with new materials and, and go to space and, and expand out into the solar system, the cosmos. This is just too, too daunting for us all. We've all closed down. And this is what Tocqueville sees near the end. It's in uh, volume two, part three, last three or four chapters. He sees this great exhaustion coming upon all of us. And, and he, he asked the question, how can, how can this be uh, addressed? And perhaps my favorite passage in the book uh, is in the chapter on um, uh, civic associations in which he says, and it's gonna be a slightly different translation, feelings and ideas are renewed. Think of the verbs, feelings and ideas are renewed. The heart enlarged, the mind expanded, 
only by the reciprocal actions of men one upon another. And what he means by this is that the, the, the magic ingredient to save us from this great exhaustion are these face-to-face -face relations. Uh, and you know this because when you meet a friend and you go have tea or lunch, uh, you, you come home and, and through the conversation, you've learned something more about yourself and learned something more about the world. And oftentimes, uh, if you've been in a bit of a funk because you've been isolated and alone, you walk away from that gathering and you say, what happened here? How was it that I became so withdrawn and, and lost into myself? And this is the great problem that Tocqueville sees is the, the self-withdrawal of human beings into themselves. Uh, and, and here, a quick pause about text messaging. I think text messaging in a way confirms this because we text message because we're afraid of having real-time communications with people. We'd send a text, somebody responds when they're in the right kind of mood or has something snippy to say. And no, my recommendation is that we, we stop text messaging and we just call. How many of us now text message a person and say, hey, can, can I call you? When can I call you? I mean, this, this is a habit of mind, people. We, we can argue and say, no, no, we have to go back to the founder's vision. I'm just going to presume that many of you are, are conservative, but maybe not. You've got your own view, uh, what political program we need, and that's fine. My point is that what Tocqueville saw is that the, the deeper problem, the, the reason why we're moving toward what I call uh, the gentle seduction of tyranny, the reason we're moving there is because of the habits of mind that we have the inability to deal with one another in face-to-face -face relations. And I would add, just as a, as a corollary, uh, identity politics is an easy way in which we can hide from ourselves because we simply say, well, this is my identity. Uh, these are the preconditions under which we gather. And Tocqueville would have laughed at this because we have to build a world together. And while provisionally, I might be part Lebanese and you, you pick your own, go ahead. Uh, it, it's, it's not gonna help us if we're trying to you know, figure out where the road goes or what kind of school system we have. It's just not gonna help us. So on Tocqueville's view, we only discover who we are um, through dealing with one another in face-to-face -face relations. And identity politics is a, is a premature determination. It, it basically says, I don't care about face-to-face -face relations. I know who I am. And Tocqueville's point was, we don't know who we are. There's an exquisite passage, a chapter in, on poetry in the last portion of it. I'm not gonna quote it. He says something like this. He says, uh, uh, if we were if we were utterly transparent, uh, we would need no poetry. Uh, we would be like gods. If we were utterly uh, opaque uh, and didn't know ourselves or didn't know others, there would be no poetry either. But the problem with man is that he lives in this world of translucence where we partly get things and partly don't. Uh, and, and we're a mystery that goes all the way down and we will never fully know who we are. And as a consequence, the best we can do is not search as the revolutionary does for transparency, because no transparency will ever be found. This is Rousseau's longing, transparency. Uh, and Marx is at the end of history, right? When we end alienation and we have transparency with respect to ourselves and others. Uh, the term you need to think about in when you're thinking about Tocqueville is translucence. We sort of see, and that's the best we get. We're not opaque, but there is no transparency. Uh, that means there is no authenticity. It means we're struggling in the dark always to find our way. And in the meantime, what we're to do is to build a world together in these face-to-face -face relations. It's a very tall order, it's a difficult order. It seems to be one that where, where we exhibit only powerlessness and it seems like all powers at the national government. He's saying, no, if you wanna say democ save democratic liberty, it's in your face-to-face -face relations with your neighbor. Yes, vote, vote at the national election. But the most important thing is what you do with your neighbor tomorrow and in your mediating institution. So he sees this great exhaustion and he provides an antidote, which is only through these face-to-face -face relations, but as the state grows stronger and stronger, there are fewer and fewer occasions for us to build a world together because we don't need each other. Uh, and in fact, I don't think identity politics could possibly emerge had not the state become sufficiently powerful that we don't need to look at our neighbors as somebody who we need. We can look at them as a prospective other, as a demonic other. This is inconceivable in the Tocquevillian world because there is no state to protect us. We have to, we have to solve our problems with our neighbor. So he sees the great exhaustion, proposes an antidote. Uh, and, and really a corollary of this, I think he sees a fear of pluralism. You know, there's a great deal of talk about diversity these days. And Tocqueville would say, no, 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 no. You're, you, you're talking about diversity, but, but really you want, you want everyone to be more or less the same. 
You want every identity group to believe the same things for starters. Uh, and so there's an appearance of, of, of plurality, but to cite him directly in the chapter on pantheism, which is in volume two, part one, he says, unity becomes an obsession. This too is a habit of mind uh, that we're not able to deal with people who are really different from us. I had I teach in the Middle East and I have for, off and on for the past almost 20 years now. And I had a, a covered Muslim woman come into my office and she said to me, Professor Mitchell, why, why are all your colleagues telling me I have an identity? I'm a Muslim. Why do I have to have an identity? I want you to think about that, right? We can't let people just self-declare. We have to insist that, no, they have an identity. We're going to tell them what it is, or they're, we're going to help them discover what it is. Everybody has to have an identity. And, and Gene and I have been in this business long enough to know that 20, 30 years ago, maybe more, the word did not have currency. And now everybody is talking about identity. And I would advise you, if you want to have clear thinking, uh, to, to not use the term. You, do, you can say I'm an American. You don't have to say my identity is American. There's perfectly satisfactory ways to, ident to identify who you are um, without invoking this language. So what Tocqueville sees is that amidst this apparent plurality, there's ultimately in the democratic age a fear of real pluralism, a real pluralism. And this might mean in terms of foreign policy, by the way, that there are different countries of the world that aren't going to be democratic. And that's fine. Uh, because he does say that every religion has some political opinion linked to it by affinity. That's a rough quote. And, and what that means, if you, if you follow it through, is that Christianity probably gives rise to democracy. Not always, but can, more likely to. Uh, Islam probably gives rise to constitutional monarchy. My Middle Eastern students would tell me, why are your silly American students coming over to the Middle East and telling me that democracy is the universal political form? We know that constitutional monarchy is the highest political form. So. You need to think about this. Are we prepared to live with real pluralism, real differences where we're where we're we're not trying to to find the universal translator? Some of you might have heard the book called Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Uh, philosophically, it's a very interesting issue because men and women are, have, are there respects in which they're the same and respects in which they're different. And the corollary is respects in which they're going to understand each other and respects in which they may not. Uh, and the search for the universal translator is a proclamation that we can't let those differences remain. We, we can't live with those differences. Another way to think about this is in terms of federalism. Uh, what's wrong with having 50 different laws about important moral issues? What's wrong with that? Well, if you believe that unity is an obsession or unity becomes an obsession, it, it becomes unthinkable to say, with respect to Roe versus Wade. I mean, it's a, a touchy subject and I don't want to go into details, but what's wrong with taking 20, 30, 40 years and having the different states work this through and maybe 30 years after the, the 1970s decision, 30, 40, 50 years, they're actually, we actually arrive at a national consensus, a political consensus, not a legal one, a political consensus. Because if you don't arrive at a political consensus, you can't prematurely determine what the conclusion is legally. It's gonna come back and haunt you. So on Tocqueville's account, you, you have to have these 50 different laboratories to update his number of states. You have to have these different laboratories where all sorts of different things are being tried. And nations themselves, the multiple nations of the world, uh, represent the plurality of the world. Different wagers about possible alternative futures would be one way of looking at this. So Tocqueville is thinking in that sort of world we're thinking about that sort of world as the antidote to the kinder and gentler despotism uh, to which we would succumb at the end of history. And he, again, I'll say it now, third or fourth time. It's, it's not about the political position you have. It's about whether your habits of mind comport to democratic liberty or not. There's a deeper problem than politics. It's the temptation to tyranny that resides in all of us. And by that, by tyranny, I don't simply mean the lust for power. I mean, succumbing to the gentle tyranny at the end of history, where uh, to, to describe a passage that no doubt uh, Professor Yarbrough will talk about later, uh, where we have entertainment culture, where we have a very small circle. The COVID regime is the kinder and gentler despotism at the end of history, where you get to download your Netflix and binge watch, and you have your food delivered to your door, and you don't know your neighbor, 
uh, and, this, and the state is constantly telling you to be afraid and only the state can save you. This is the kinder and gentler despotism that Tocqueville talks about. So uh, don't get me wrong. I, I, I believe that medical problems are real medical problems and, and we need to address them. But we also live in a political world and we have to be careful of the consequences of medical decisions. There's a larger challenge in front of us. The COVID uh, pandemic is, is it lasts a couple of years, but the fate of democracy, the fate of liberty in the world is something that's on a several hundred year trajectory. And we have to think about that trajectory as well. Uh, also, uh, the um, the term American exceptionalism, he doesn't exactly invent it, but he 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 the the passage that gets cited by Lewis Hartz in this famous book called The Liberal Tradition in America, which is the basis of of the argument for American exceptionalism, is to be found in uh, in Democracy in America in the author's introduction, by the way. Uh, and I want to be clear because there's a lot of silliness about this term. Uh, for, for too many years, young people have been, for decades, young people have been watching Barney and Sesame Street. And the idea there is that exceptional means special. Everybody's exceptional. Everybody's special. That is not what American exceptionalism means in Tocqueville's vernacular. What it means is America is the exception to the rule. And we have to then ask, what's the rule? The rule is that the whole of the world is aristocratic. Uh, and, uh, and America is the exception to the rule. And if you want to think about aristocratic, what that means very, very briefly, it's a, it's some of you come from ethnic families, you know, this, uh, you know, you come over, my family came over, my father's family came over the 1890s from Lebanon. Uh, traditional understandings of roles, uh, that, that you're not your person, you are your role. Uh, you have a set of obligations or to put it in slightly different terms, you're not your own. Nothing more characterizes the democratic soul than the idea that he or she is his or her own. And so you can do what you want to your body, for example. Uh, you, you can do what you want. You are your own. And in the aristocratic age, you're not your own. You're, you're part of a role or you bear a role, uh, which is, is the thing that de de determines you. And you're part of a long chain of generations. Uh, and, and, and you think in terms of what you're... If you're going to go down to M Street in Washington on a Thursday night, I tell my students, what are your great grandparents going to say about that? Or what are your great grandchildren going to say uh, when you go do your crazy things on the weekend? They say, well, we don't worry about that. We're just thinking about the moment. I said, yes, you're democratic souls. So there's a whole list. I wish I had sent it to you, a whole list of distinguishing features between the democratic and the aristocratic age. So what, what Tocqueville's saying is that America is the first place on earth where you don't have a long aristocratic history. Now, you'll say, well, what does that really mean? Well, you have to understand the problem. And I saw this in the Middle East, and that's why I wrote the book called Tocqueville in Arabia. Um, if you have a long history of aristocratic memory or long aristocratic memories and habits and institutions, it is incredibly difficult to shift into a, let's call it a democratic mode. And one of the things you're likely to do is to stop halfway and say, well, this isn't working. We need to go back in the case of Islam, to the 13th century, which is what Al-Qaeda did believe was necessary to do. So, so if you come from an aristocratic past, it is not going to be easy to step into this democratic mode where you're thinking about uh, uh, almost frictionless movements. Uh, corruption is, uh, see, in the aristocratic age, there is no corruption, there's just patronage. We, we call that corruption. There's all these terms and all these ways of thinking that in the aristocratic age are, are, are deep and are difficult to dislodge. And so as you step into the modern world, so to speak, it's not easy. The story of the Middle East is, is the proof of this. Uh, and, and so the temptation is going to be to re-enchant the world. But he says America is the exception. And that's why America represents the future. And this, this is something you should know about. If you look at the history of political thought before Tocqueville, and you look at how authors thought about America, America was the past. America was the natural state of man. But after Tocqueville, it changes. America represents a possible future uh, where you don't have any aristocratic guardrails whatsoever. This is part of the answer, by the way, to why, why so many nations of the world hate America. Now, there are, there are good foreign policy, stupid foreign policy decisions that America has made, which has also contributed to that. So, so don't mistake me. But yeah, having been in the Middle East, there's this sense that the Middle Easterners have 
that America is completely disembodied democratic souls. They, they think we all live, I'm, I kid you not, you, you go to Iraq where I was for two years, and they think we're all Baywatch people who don't have friends. And uh, it, it's just extraordinary how they, what they think Americans are. And Tocqueville saw what they saw, namely this general movement toward ever-growing isolation and, and really despair, which is what all the anti-modern critics point out about America. And Tocqueville saw the problem, but he also saw the antidote to the problem, which is now that we have become delinked, we must relink. And we can only do this voluntarily. The aristocratic age, he says, is linked in one long chain from peasant to king through the roles that people had, through reciprocal obligations and loyalties, what I call an economy of obligation and loyalty, where cash is not king. You destroy those reciprocal obligations, and the only way life can move forward is through cash, moneyed economy. Marx saw this. I mean, he's brilliant. In the in the early pages of the Communist Manifesto, you must read it. It's an extraordinary set of observations about the destruction of an old order and how money becomes the universal measure. So Tocqueville saw all this happening, but he said, no, America is different because it doesn't have an aristocratic past. And what that means for us, gang, and I, I'm speaking to you as possible future statesmen and stateswomen, what this means is that we have to understand that the rest of the world is not like us, probably doesn't like exactly what we want. They may. They, but but it's going to be on their own terms. Uh, and so we, we have to understand that we are the exception to the rule. It's not that we're special. We might be for other reasons, but but we're the exception to the rule. And that means a great deal of humility must be involved whenever we decide we're going to use our military force abroad. Uh, and, and I'll say one more thing, and then and there's a lot more I, I need to say about Tokyo himself. Um, I think he also saw in a couple of very pregnant passages the crisis of Islam. Uh, there are two or three places in democracy in America where in, let's say this, 1835, 1840, uh, long before the modern Middle East was constituted, by which I mean the Middle East that has Israel in it, uh, long before the modern Middle East was constituted, there, were, there was a crisis within Islam, and, and that crisis takes the form of of the, the question, is it possible to both be Muslim and modern at the same time? And Tocqueville thought that this was an almost an insurmountable crisis. Why? Because he says, if you have a religion that's committed to all sorts of particular things, hygiene, understanding of science, et cetera, when those understandings change, you're either going to have to reject science or reject your religion. And he says, the great advantage of Christianity is that it has general suppositions or propositions about about human relations. So uh, take care of the widows and the children. Yes, uh, t love your neighbor, love God above all else. He says these things can survive entrance into the modern world, science, et cetera. But he doesn't think Islam is because it's a comprehensive doctrine. It's a comprehensive way of life. And we know this term, this term way of life. Go look it up on Google. Millions and millions of hits. And it's a code for, for a, a comprehensive uh, understanding the world where everything is absorbed within a larger system uh, of, of explanation. And so you live, and here's my favorite word again, without the problem of, of non-parsimoniousness, or you live in a parsimonious world. And so he does say in one place, religion is necessary, but he wants to distinguish between two kinds of religion. One, the religion that allows you to live in a broken world without parsimony in hope, that's the good kind and the bad kind. And here he's, he is singling out Islam. And I've had very painful conversations with this about my Muslim students in the Middle East over these many years. The, the bad kind or the kind that will not work in the democratic age is the one that offers the one that offers a comprehensive doctrine because the problem of the modern life of modern life is that things don't fit together and they never will unless you're going to live in a dream. Got it. So. Let me uh, let me just say one more thing about uh, I'm going to I'm going to jump into this theory of mediation in a second, but I just want to say um, say something more about these habits of mind. I picked out three. There's many more. Uh, I, the first one I named that we have to avoid is the the claim the concept of unity becomes an obsession. We have to be able to live with real difference. 
we have to be able to live with with a, a federal system where different states have different laws. We, and then with respect to personal relations, we have to be able to live with others with this halfway understanding where we sort of know each other, but not really. It's back to this longing for transparency and authenticity, these romantic words which 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 promise that 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 no stone will be unturned and, and all the veils will be lifted. And he's saying, no, if, if you're really going to live in a world of plurality, you have to recognize that there's some things you don't understand and it's OK. And, you know, husbands and wives aren't going to completely understand each other. You and your best friend aren't going to completely understand each other. It's OK. So this this fixation on unity, we have to fight. Uh, tooth and nail. Um, and then the other one, I, which I've also or another one I've named is uh, to be found. It's in volume two, part one, chapter eight. The human mind imagines the possibility of an ideal, but always fugitive perfection, the perfectionist impulse. It's a corollary to this one, because if we don't know the person next to us. We also recognize that they're not perfect and, and nor are we. But he thinks the great temptation is this longing for perfection. And you have to see how it plays out. Uh, it, it, so we look at we look at various American institutions and we, we pick out the things that make it imperfect. And we say, therefore, uh, conscience must be against it. And his answer is, no, that's not how you do this. There is no perfect institution. It's you set you set one imperfect imperfect institution next to another one. Uh, that's how you do this. It's it's there is never going to be perfection. Uh, you have to live with imperfection. Another way of coming at this in terms of our lives, gang, is do you think in terms of problem solving, or do you think in terms of making things slightly less bad? Now, if you're thinking in terms of problem solving, you're saying, well, here's a set of problems and, and here's the answer to the problem. And then that's it. And I can't tell you over the past 30 years at Georgetown how many young Turks faculty members have come in with proposals to solve the problem of, of the graduate education. Here's what we're going to do. And then five years later, it's a disaster. and We have to revisit it. And a new group of people comes in and says, well, here's how we're going to solve the problem. OK. Whenever you hear the word problem solving, you're thinking as a democratic soul. He says an aristocratic soul thinks only in terms of amelioration, making things slightly less bad. Michael Oakeshott said something very beautiful. Politics is the art of taking the next step. Stop being an ideologue. Stop saying we have to go in this direction. There might be times when we have to go in this direction and there might be times we have to go in another direction. Politics is the art of taking the next step. Um, we're not talking about him here, but but one of my favorite passages from or one of my favorite distinctions in Edmund Burke is the distinction between the excellence of simplicity and the excellence of composition. It's a beautiful distinction. And he thinks that the French Revolution is driven by the excellence of simplicity. What is the excellence of simplicity? Well, there's one problem we have to solve. We have to have the universal rights of man or here. Let's do another one. Uh, we have one problem. It's COVID. And it doesn't matter what the collateral damage is. COVID is the only thing we need to pay attention to. The excellence of simplicity. Or or Karl Marx. Class is the single thing you need to pay attention to. It's the key to the riddle of history. He literally says that. So whenever you see somebody who's looking for one answer, who's problem solving, you're working with somebody who thinks in terms of the excellence of simplicity. Now, the excellence of composition is very different. It's a recognition that you move one part and every other part moves. And the only way you can learn this is in the subtle mediational relations and institutions that we have. You you learn that in your family, there's there's no, you do one thing and there's all these other things. And so there isn't an answer to your problems. You, you just go step by step. Or in your local community, you have to go step by step. But this is the habit of mind, excellence of composition, or excellence of simplicity. And I will say I have met, if you are a conservative here, maybe you aren't, but if you are a conservative, you must adopt the excellence of composition. This is what a conservative does. It's, and that's why Oak, Oakshot said of Americans, American conservatives who, have the, who think they have a plan to solve problems aren't conservatives. If you have a plan, then you're not a conservative. Now, maybe that's a bit strong, but I want you to think about this habit of mind that we all are tempted by. It's the habit of mind that comes naturally into our imagination. 
which is the habit of thinking of an answer to a problem. And yet in life, there are constant trade-offs because the world, of, I've now said this a few times, is fun, it's constituted as plural. You can't push one button and make everything happen the way you want it to. There are all sorts of cross-cutting movements, which you, which you can come to understand through this remarkable form of knowledge about which I've said nothing. It's called prudence, prudential knowledge. Whereas the democratic soul is concerned with method knowledge. It's right there in the first paragraph or the first page of, of, of volume two, part one, chapter one. The, the, the American philosophical method. It's not by accident that he uses the word method uh, because he, he sets next to the idea of method, the idea of prudential knowledge. And he asks, by the way, um, is there any group in America uh, that, that have this prudential knowledge that can, that can act as an invisible break upon the excesses of the democratic soul, which is always running after one single answer to one single problem or to, to, our, to all of our problems. And he says, yes, it's the legal caste. Uh, and yet, if you look at what's happened in law schools, they've completely abandoned the teaching of prudence. It's all democratic method. The, the inner key of the law is this, this, or this. It was law and economics in the 1980s. It's critical legal theory, critical race theory now. Uh, it, always searching for one way of understanding the law. This is this habit of mind called the excellence of simplicity. What I'm trying to get you to think about, gang, is what sorts of habits of mind, what sorts of self-understandings lead us to uh, the gentle seduction of tyranny? I don't care what your politics are. It, they lead us in that direction. And what I want to get to shortly is his account of these mediating institutions through which uh, we, can, we can be formed in such a way that we can have the antidote to these habits that come natural to our imagination. So let me turn to that now. Um, uh, first, he has, um, by the way, uh, I, I'm more than happy if you just wanna raise your hand at any time and pose a question, okay? So just, and Claire, if I don't see it, can you can you uh, call on someone? Okay, Yes. so please, please great, so do that. So, so first, um, D democracy is coming, okay? This is the age of democracy. Now, I wanna be clear, he, he means this in a strange way. Occasionally he will use the term democracy to mean a, a set of political arrangements, but by and large, and you must never forget this, he thinks of this as a social condition of equality, okay? Democracy is a social condition of equality. So when I teach, teach that to my students, I say, but look at all the inequalities around here. I said, Tocqueville's not refuted here. So the social condition of equality, think of it this way. Uh, I'll use Hegel's language. Um, what I think Tocqueville sees is that as you break the social links between castes, uh, roles fall apart and we become, I'll just use the term, persons. And under those conditions, what happens is we can see each other for the first time. We can see the suffering of others across the chasm that once separated us because of social classes. So we can see into each other's eyes. This is why this passage, feelings and ideas and are renewed the heart and large only by the reciprocal actions of men one upon another is so important because it's, it's seeing. It's you and I seeing each other as persons. Now, you might have more money than me. You might be in a different social class than me. You might be a different race than me, but recognition and seeing here means that you and I can see each other for the first time. And so the, the general movement here of history is you move from an aristocratic age where you're only seeing a role to the democratic age where you're for the first time seeing a person's. All these links are being broken down. And the question is, where does that go? And can you build a world simply on a, on, a, on a world that's completely, can you build a civilization on a world that's completely delinked with isolated, lonely people? And his answer is, no, you really can't. And I'll say something about uh, bipolarity right now, but I want to develop a little more a little bit later. Um, I think he thinks that, uh, that in the aristocratic age, by virtue of your roles, You've got all these strings connecting you to other people through reciprocal obligations. And so, you know, do this experiment. I'm looking up at my ceiling. Imagine a ball drop down three feet from the ceiling and all the strings attached to it on all those side walls at the top. It can't move. 
Now start cutting the strings. And what happens? And the ball is going to start oscillating back and forth from from too much to too little. Uh, and I think that's his picture. He sees he sees human life in this delink condition as oscillating back and forth between withdrawal and frenzy, which is a description of manic depression. Too much and too little. Uh, and and he's asking the question, how how can this be attenuated? Just a quick example. Uh, toward the end of, of volume two, he has this exquisite passage, which after 30 years of reading, I only just discovered or reread and remembered. I, I see, I'm paraphrasing, I see a time when men will think of themselves as greater than kings and less than men. I did not say or, I said and. Greater than kings and less than men. And you have to understand how this emerges sociologically or rather because of the sociological changes when you are linked to everybody you're held fast when all the links are broken and here i'm thinking of social media you can be a sovereign self you can defriend anybody you don't like you can cut them off of your twitter feed or whatever uh, so you're your sovereign self in your own little private space which is why i give a lecture called facebook is death which i'm not going to give you now so you're, you're your own sovereign self uh, there with, uh, and you make your claims about identity and nobody can touch you because identity is pre-linguistic and so nobody has a right to challenge you on anything. So there you are, sovereign man. I remember how I said identity politics is correlated to globalism. Different sources of sovereignty. But on the other hand, the consequence of being delinked is that you're isolated and alone. And so the the the, the central consequence of this delinkage that is accomplished in the democratic age, through which we move from being roles to persons, is this psychological uh, instability emerges uh, when you have isolation. The condition of isolation makes you both sovereign and utterly impotent. You have to see this. And so he's asking the question, well, so what do we do about this? And on his view, we have to gather together. And I, I think this is one of the several great questions in democracy in America. How shall we be gathered? Because he recognizes that the inner truth of the democratic age, as my Middle Eastern students are quick to point out, is loneliness and isolation. That, that is the inner truth. That's what happens when you break the links. And generation upon generation uh, is confirmation of these breaking of the links. You can, you can talk to your grandparents or perhaps remember them. And, and they will tell you stories about a web of connections that we can't even imagine, let alone reconstruct. Yes? So that's what happens, generation after generation after generation. That makes us equal in some sense. But this equality uh, can easily turn into a quality of servitude unless we figure out how to be responsible moral agents. And I'm here to tell you that being a, a sovereign self who's greater than king, a greater than king, and who has no need for a neighbor is not the way out. And nor is it being uh, a, a self that feels lonely, isolated, and impotent, and feels like he or she is less than a human being. So what we have to do then is move out of this binodal arrangement where we're dwelling um, where we're where we're oscillating and, and where we're located experientially either in withdrawal and feelings of utter worthlessness or feeling like you're a sovereign, manic depression. I mean, that's what I'm talking about here, yes? So, so how do we address that problem? And on Tocqueville's view, um, the only way to attenuate this problem is through these mediating institutions, which re-link us, right? So once we were linked, the inner truth of the democratic age is the delinkage of man. And so what do we do? Well. We have, if we want to have democratic liberty, we have to relink. And here, I, here I need to now raise the, the theoretical point. Uh, it's the relationship between the one, the two, and the many, or the one, the few, and the many. So Tocqueville has a general theory about society, in which you, you will always have the one, the few, and the many. And in the aristocratic age, you had the king, the nobles, and let's just say the rest, the many. Now, how were the many gathered together? They were gathered together under the authority of the noble, 
Now, this changes, moves back and forth. Sometimes it's the authority of the king. There's, there's this back and forth where the aristocrats are playing off of, every group is playing off of every other one. Tocqueville's really good on that. Uh, but, but there was a way to be gathered together. It was through the authority of a name, a family name. Uh, but in the democratic age, all that's gone. Nobody cares about your family name. In Europe, they still do. They want to know if your first name, if you have a de in front of it or, or a von in German, they, they, they still do. Americans don't even understand what that means because we're largely a, a democratic peoples. So you, you want to, um, you, in the aristocratic age, you've got the king, the nobles, and the many. Now, you can be a really good Marxist here and, and recognize that what happens as you move from that age to the new one, and Marx says feudalism to capitalism, um, the first group to go are the landed aristocrats. Because industrial, let's just be Marx for a second, industrialization just destroys the landed property base of basis of wealth. So the middle, the, the few are destroyed. And of course, this was one of the active tasks of the French Revolution. Okay, so so what happens when you get the democratic age? Well, the one of the king becomes the one of the state. You still have the many. And then between them, there's a gigantic question mark because you don't have landed aristocrats anymore. Something has to fill the gap in his view. And the only thing that can fill that gap are these mediating institutions. To mediate is to stand between, yes? And Tocqueville is a theorist of mediation, never forget that. Uh, and so uh, his view is we must have robust mediating institutions, our families, our local governments, uh, our, our religious networks, our civic associations. Um, and, and without them, you and I cannot be well-formed and we will succumb to this gentle seduction of tyranny at the end of history. Now, I need to say more because there's, uh, well, let me say something about these. Let me carry on. So, all right, so what do we, what do we learn in these mediating institutions? And, and I'll, I will be so bold as to, to paraphrase Plato and completely turn him on his head. You know, in the Republic, Plato says something like this, only philosophy can save us. Only philosophy can save us. Um, it's at 473D in book five if you want to go look at it. Uh, but, but Tocqueville, if you really press me on this, I think I would say on Tocqueville's account, only institutions can save us. Now, maybe that's too strong. But he believes in those institutions so strongly that without them, he knows things are com going to completely fall apart. And, and the question is, you know, what are we, what are we learning here? Um, so I want you to think about the, the, all the mediating institutions you're involved in. And I want you to observe something. Um, we learned there, I'm going to just go down a list. And this is not an exhaustive list. And if you want an exhaustive list, Yuval Levine has written a wonderful book, uh, which Claire, you might be able to uh, draw, bring to their attention, in which he lays out exactly a whole list of things that we learn, learn in our mediating institutions. But first and foremost, you ready? In the age of equality, what we learn is how to rule and be ruled within these mediating institutions. Now, this turns out to be really important because we have this legal, I call it a fiction. I don't mean this in a falsehood, in the sense of falsehood, but in terms of our lived lives, in all of our mediating institutions, there is hierarchy. Even in your friendship groups, there's, there's someone who's, who's generally the leader and maybe that switches back and forth, but you're, you're learning something really important in these mediating associations, in your family. You'll learn when you can speak up, when you can't speak up, uh, what, what's appropriate to speak about. There's a thousand small things you learn about ruling and being ruled. And if you don't learn that, there's no way you can become a good citizen. And, and by that, I mean one uh, who, who could say, well, OK, now our party's going to rule. And but but we believe it's OK. We can be ruled by another party in four years. It's OK. And then we'll have our chance. But you have to learn this ruling and being ruled because all of these institutions are hierarchical institutions where we learn that among among other things. But this is an incredibly important thing for us to get. Um, and then uh, something that I think is terribly important, we learn competence. I've used this word once before. Um, it's really a remarkable thing, this 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 competence. You're you're at a place in your career, late 20s, 
maybe 30s, where you're, I'm guessing, struggling because you know you can develop competencies, but you don't yet have the opportunity. And you want to have that opportunity because you know that through that you can develop a healthy kind of pride, a healthy kind of self-sufficiency. Uh, and, and the relations between persons are a competence that friendship, love, these are competencies that no book can teach you. Once you know them, a book can amplify what you already know. This is what Aristotle was claiming in the Nicomachean Ethics, right? Um, but you have to learn these, these incredibly important competencies in your family, in your long years of schooling, with your neighbors. There's so many subtle understandings we develop, which we, and here I'll move on a slightly new tack, but not really, which we can't fully explain. So human beings are beings who know more than they can say. And these competencies are, are the things that we, we can't fully say. So I put myself uh, through college and for a long time after that, was fortunate to work with both master carpenters and master boat builders. And it, when you're in an, an apprentice relationship, a true apprentice relationship, you can ask all the questions you want. And they will oftentimes tell you a few things, but but you know that they have a knowledge that can't be reduced to the few things that they say. Just as a good cook can give you the recipe, but sorry, that's not going to make you a great cook. So these this vast reservoir of invisible knowledge must be developed and can only be developed in these reciprocal relations, face-to-face -face relations in these various institutions. And so we learn not only the specific general things about about friendship and social life, but but the kinds of things that are appropriate within education, the kinds of things that are appropriate within a family, the kinds of things that are appropriate within a religious institution. We learn differentiation. These are there's no book that can teach us these things, gang. The schools, when the families start, we've already discovered this. When families start falling apart, the school system can't step in and be mommy and daddy. It it does not work. These institutions have to have their proper functions. And if they don't, others can't take them on because they're not built for that. So we, we learn how to rule and be ruled. We develop this competence, this vast reservoir of invisible knowledge, which I want to come back to. Um, we learn trust. There's no book that can teach you trust. There's no philosophical argument that can convince you that trust is necessary. You have to learn it. And it's it's a very painful thing to learn because there's often betrayal. And, and then you still have to trust. And Tocqueville thought that without this glue, the social glue, his recommendation wouldn't work. And remember his recommendation. Once we were linked, now we're delinked. Now we must relink. You can't do this without trust. And the only way to build trust is on a daily basis. So let me just say something about the Tahrir Square uprisings. None of which surprised me. The results of this did not surprise me at all. So the, the, the Obama administration through Hillary Clinton had a foreign policy plan uh, based on social media. They, their argument was authoritarianism ran so deep in the Middle East that the only way you'd have revolutionary change would be if you had uh, social media. Uh, but so, uh, Claire, is that your hand or is that somebody else's hand? My hand for somebody else's hand. We have okay. about uh, 15 minutes. I have three questions and I know queued up. Okay. So whenever you're ready. Then I am going to stop and we're going to go with questions. I'll say okay. more about this invisible knowledge in a bit, but go ahead. Questions. All right. So go. Uh, for, oh, you go, you go, go ahead. All right. Um, uh, are you hearing me? Yes. All right. Yeah. So my, all right, cool. My question goes about American exceptionalism because I, I really got to, to think about it. Is that, yeah, right. If the rule is that the world is, is ruled by, by aristocratic or oligarchic systems and models and America is a democracy because, yeah, you don't have a, an original aristocracy, so you develop in a different way. What happens for those countries that try to engage in those small changes that are not really, we're not problem solving, but still, how, how do we do it so we can get like self-rule 
and self-government and all that kind of stuff, if we still don't have the right elements to, to get into that point. I mean, you, you talked about your book of, of Tocqueville and Arabia, and I was thinking Latin America is a, is a very complex case, even more complex than, than Poland, which I'm studying a lot because I'm here. But Latin America, I mean, we formally don't have aristocracies anymore. But that Spanish period never really left, to be honest. And on the other hand, we're republics, very much based on the American model. But at the same time, the American Republic still kind of works. Latin American republics never have worked. So wh where's the catch in, in that? I mean, wh what's your take on that? Because it really overwhelms me that, I mean, the French influence in Latin America is stronger than, than in, in the US. And yet we didn't get the best of like thinkers like Tocqueville, yet you did. So, I mean, it's kind of paradoxical for me. Yeah, so look, you're asking when when the when the Berlin Wall fell, uh, there were uh, everybody rediscovers Tocqueville again. Why? Because you've got this authoritarian system, and now it's over. And so, how can we bring democracy to Eastern Europe? And they and they discover Tocqueville, except they discover only one part of Tocqueville. They they discover that yeah, you've got to have mediating institutions to have liberty. But now, to your point they didn't get all of Tocqueville because there are passages in Tocqueville where he recognizes that, that if you have these aristocratic habits of mind or, or legacy institutions or arrangements, it's going to take a really, really long time. And by that, I mean hundreds and hundreds of years because the, what Tocqueville sees, and very few people see this in Tocqueville, he sees that the power of memory runs very, very deep, that nations do not forget their past. Uh, and yet, if you look at the first really substantive chapter on the Puritans, he says something like this, uh, I'll paraphrase. He says, the, the national character, character is established at the beginning, and it's always there and never changes. Meaning if you started with an aristocracy, it's going to be incredibly difficult to change. So I, I don't have any easy words of solace here. I tried to get at this earlier when I said, when I was talking about the racial wound in America and how it would take hundreds and hundreds of years to heal. The interesting thing about the way Tocqueville positions this democratic age is he says, here are all these people who think they can make themselves instantly, right? They are their own. They can change their pr preferences, et cetera. But what he sees is, no, we're also on a longer course trajectory um, and, and that some nations are going to be are going to be agonizing in their movement uh, to the democratic age. I don't, I wish I could say something more that would be hopeful, but what he gets is, and this is one of the things, reasons why I think he's important to understand for us in the 21st century. He understands that memory runs really deep. So I can't offer you real solace there. It's just, we have to keep working. All Charlie. Right, so, yeah, go uh, ahead. Just as a, as a, as a quick follow-up your suggestion like considering like that latin america is quite different from from the us in that sense is that like uh, under your reading of Tocqueville, we should be trying to lean back into into the best elements of, of the spanish uh, system that we had back in the day instead of trying to copy too hard the, the american model i'm what I'm saying is that there are path dependencies in every country that make it difficult to take a template, say a constitution, mm -hmm. and impose it. I say this with great pain because of what happened to Iraq. There was this rich country with all sorts of path dependencies and and the United States and Britain come in and, and drop a constitution on it. And having been there and having talked to, I think he's still the president of Iraq, Baram Saleh, he was my chairman of the board when I was the, the, the chancellor of the American University of Iraq. He, he would tell me over and over again, you, you don't understand, you can't come in and drop a piece of paper on top of a, of a country and expect that it's going to work. 
the, your peoples have to have certain habits of mind for for certain sorts of political arrangements to work. Now, I'm going to say one other thing. I've I've just given you the the very despairing case, but I but I have to show you the paradox here because what Tocqueville saw, and I, I'm not asking you to go get my book, but I'm just going to tell you about it. What I wrote about it in Tocqueville Arabia is that while there are these path dependencies that are holding all these nations back, there's something else that's happening. And that is that young people around the globe are all very rapidly losing the connection to their past. We're becoming a kind of glo global teenagers, the global 20-somethings. You're all listening to the same music. And so you've got two things happening at once, and that gets to the agony of the younger generation in in, in formerly aristocratic countries or in still aristocratic countries. Are you ready? Here it is. On the one hand, you look at all this stuff that, that you inherited as an utter obstacle to your thriving. And on the other hand, you see this disembodied promise of cosmopolitan life. And if you're honest with yourself, there will be times when it looks utterly vacuous and you will be tempted to think in terms of the aristocratic past as the only antidote. So what I'm saying is the younger generation is, 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 is experiencing this thing that Tocqueville's talking about. So I mentioned the first mediation. Give me one second. Claire, can we go over a few minutes? Is that possible? Okay, I, here, I, said, I said Tocqueville thinks mediationally. Are you ready? You ask a question, an important one, I gotta give it to you. I give yeah, you yeah. go ahead. <laughs> So he thinks in terms of a mediation between, yes, between, so between the one and the many or the mediating institutions. But here's the other way in which he thinks about mediation. He thinks about the mediation between the aristocratic age and the democratic age. And most of us, he says, are still stuck somewhere between where we have enough memory of the past, which we're both drawn to and repulsed by, and and we can taste, and this is your generation, you can taste this promise of a disembodied life through Facebook, universal connections around the globe without limits. And so you all are you are are stretched like a rubber band between two worlds, a world of promise that 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 gives you some hope that all of the obstructions from your past can be renounced. Uh, and on the other hand, there are moments when, because there's nothing concrete about it, you're tempted to go back to the aristocratic age. This is why I say the, the age of, I don't want to be too despairing, but I have to say this, the age of war is not over. What Tocqueville saw was that this, this, this movement toward the democratic age would be really, really difficult for aristocratic peoples, and they would occasionally want to go all the way back and occasionally want to go all the way forward. And the reason why this has shown up in the Middle East first, gang, I know the problem, I used to teach in Buenos Aires for three years in a row. Uh, uh, so I have some understanding uh, of what's going on there. But, uh, but what Tocqueville thought was, what the, what, why this is happening in the Middle East first is because the Middle East has gone what's called hypermodern. They have, look at Dubai, look at Qatar, look at Saudi Arabia, they've gone hypermodern. And so they have no way of gathering themselves together. They've bought all the way into modernity. And I, I can tell you, my students in Qatar, on any given hour, would oscillate back and forth between longing for complete release from this oppressive system from, in which they grew up in, and on the other hand, feeling so isolated and alone based on the promise of Facebook, Meta, uh, digital substitutism, all the stuff that you guys are living in and, and don't find nourishment in, uh, that, you, that you're tempted to go back. And so the agony for the 21st century, Tocqueville thought, for most of the world would, you'd have, would be that you would have generation after generation that was caught between the promise and the memory. And that's why the 21st century would be so agonizing. And you, what you have done is described it. Please. Go ahead, Charlie. Uh, Dr. Mitchell, uh, thanks again for joining us. My first question is, what is the difference between Nietzsche's last man and Tocqueville's conception of man under democratic despotism? Is there a difference? That's a great question. So I, I mentioned that 
that there were a number of 19th century thinkers who uh, who saw the growing malaise. Marx did too, strangely enough. He thought we would all become social justice warriors, calls it bourgeois socialism. That's his dystopian future, by the way. Uh, but Marx saw it, John Stuart Mill saw it, Tocqueville saw it. Be before him, Rousseau saw it in the 1750s, and Nietzsche, as you say, was probably the last great exponent of it with The Last Man. And so the Tocqueville's account is a sociological one, and Nietzsche's account is a psychological one. So on Tocqueville's reading, if we have these robust institutions, we can ameliorate, I did not say solve, we can ameliorate the problem of loneliness and isolation. That's why I said only institutions can save us. On, on Nietzsche's reading, the reason why the West has become, is becoming moribund is because uh, it, it, um, it still has the legacy of Christianity and is unable to get past it. So in the 1880s, he, pre he predicted the death of Europe. What form does it take? It takes this form. Uh, you've got these people, the Enlightenment figures who think they've thrown off Christianity uh, and think they've cre they're creating a new world on the rubble of, of uh, Western Christianity. And yet, in point of fact, what they're doing is they're merely transposing all the moral insights of Christianity into philosophical form. And so they think they have become new, uh, and, and yet, in fact, they're still living with this old thing that, that must be renounced. And so their commitment to equality, to dignity of persons, all these things come out of Christianity. I got to do this in two minutes. After the last man section of the prologue is something called the three metamorphoses. The camel, the lion, the child. All civilizations must renew themselves. First, they're the camel that bears much. Then they're the lion that destroys what they have created in order to become the child to build a new civilization. What is the crisis of Europe? It rejected its religion and thought it was the lion through the enlightenment destroyed, but it did not. It merely transposed all those moral teachings that were in Christian form and, and took them and made them and made them philosophically justified. This, by the way, is German idealism, which is why he hates it. Uh, and so the fate of Europe is to is to think that it has moved. It is now the lion and can start anew. But in point of fact, it's still the camel dragging the the dead weight of Christianity, now camouflaged by Enlightenment thought, and that's why it's dying. It didn't have the strength to go back and become noble again. Christianity is the ethic of resentment. So that's it. That's my thirty second version of it. Others. Charlie, if you want to quickly ask your second question, and then I have a question from one of our European students. We can go a few minutes over if our friends are okay. Okay, uh, so today, uh, Patrick Deneen's new book, Regime Change, officially came out, and I was wondering what your uh, thoughts on his political project are. Do you think it's a uh, kind of a restoration of the Tocquevillian insight, or do you think it's a repudiation of it? I know that might be a, kind of a big question. Well, Patrick's a friend of mine. I brought him to Georgetown. I worked with him for 10 years. And I told him not to go to Notre Dame. Uh, anyway, uh, so uh, Patrick, I, uh, so I was the review, one of the two reviewers for his after Why Liberalism Failed book for Yale. And, and I, I'll say now what I said then to the Yale Press. I said, look, Patrick is among our best social critics, uh, but, but he's attributing to liberalism the things that can be attributed to Tocquevillian, that Tocqueville attributes to, to the democratic age. In other words, it's not the fault of liberalism. And my worry about the movement in, in which Patrick is a part is that, it, in my view, it's a re-enchantment movement. I've used this word before, this temptation to re-enchantment. Um, my worry about, about many members of the New Right, this includes Catholic integralists, um, is that it's a re-enchantment movement. And it, it's, it does not accord with Tocqueville's claim that we have to live in a world that's not parsimonious. There is no, there is no way to solve these problems. We've got, uh, uh, in this sense, I'm a more traditional conservative we have a constitution. There's no problem. We can't solve through it. Uh, we don't need to overthrow it and, and have regime change. So he's a fantastic social critic, but I think where he goes with it is generally wrong. All right. Last question from one of our European students is Tocqueville somehow has Tocqueville somehow anticipated the European integration project. What would be the role of the European Union in Tocqueville's view? Good. Great question. So. So oftentimes conservatives who are who um, are seem feel poisoned by this universalist impulse um, switch to the opposite end and say no no we have to go to nation and on, only the locality matters 
And the language that's that's lurking in, or the thought that's lurking in Tocqueville, he might use the language periodically, is the language of supplements and substitutes, which I have raised before. And the way I would put it, I want to first talk about the relationship between locality and nation, uh, and then the relationship between nation and the European Union. So on Tocqueville's view, look, the, the, the mother load of, of our labors must be at the local level, but the nation is a supplement for that work, but not a substitute for it. So when you have the state stepping in strongly, and as as the progress as, as happened in the progressive era, then the state becomes a substitute for those mediating institutions rather than a supplement to it. So how then can we think about international relations? It should not be either or, and it's set up as either or. Either we go back to the world of nations, or we have a cosmopolitan universalism. And I think if you think in terms of supplements and substitutes, you're true to the Tocquevillian vision, which is the EU can supplement the nations of Europe, but it cannot become a substitute for the nations of Europe. And I think that language of supplements and substitutes has, allows us to avoid the, the, the vicious polarity that gets set up oftentimes in our political debates. Tocqueville knows that we long for more. We long, we long for the universal. He actually thinks this longing for the universal that, uh, that, the, that the French Revolution inaugurated politically has its roots in Christianity itself. So he knows that we long for this universal, but he also says, no, 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 that's that's for the future. For now, we live in a world of nations. And that, by the way, is exactly what St. Augustine was arguing back in the fourth century in the city of God. We live in a plurality, a plurality of nations, and at the end time, it will be unified. And I think Tocqueville would say of the desire to completely move to integration, to move past the world of particularism, is that that's a desire to bring the end times in. Uh, before they're due. We have, there's a long patient waiting in history and that the political form appropriate to that long patient waiting is the nation. Does that mean we can't have transnational organizations? No, it does not, but it means they can't substitute for the, the embodied uh, entities that we dwell in. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Mitchell, for another extremely thought-provoking Tocqueville Masterclass. We really appreciate you taking the time uh, to share your thoughts with us. We look forward, Dr. Yarborough, to your time with us next week, and we will see you all then. Thanks so much.